2001. That was a horrible year for me. I, I experienced my, my two only uh, injuries in that year. Uh, in, in Jamaica, uh, at the seven side championship, at, at my very first game, like two minutes into the game, I was so eager to go. I sprained my ankle like two minutes into the game. And that was, that was pretty much it. For me. Hit that. I think the minute I stepped on a practice field for rugby, the calling happened. But an eight year plan to be on the team. And I was in it within two years. Don't wait until you or a pro to be a pro, right? And I walk around with a rugby ball sometimes and they're like, what is this child on? I think it looks like it was a heavy hit. It's up, it's not up. You know, that's the first time I played like professional. I'm making rugby money. How can I make money outside of it? And those two Scottish guys and I said, oh, you're, um, you're here for the movie. That rugby is a game for all shapes and sizes, all cultural um, aspects. And he looked at me and he says, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Roll rugby. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Time Abelu, and this is a show where we speak to people about the opportunities that they have found, created, or taken advantage of via rugby. Y'all, y'all. What a weekend that was had. We've got Rugby Town 7s that was just this past weekend. Like, you know, you got to love the way that 7 season ends in the summertime because it just adds, like, a different dynamic to how everybody starts getting excited back for 15s because you get all this dynamic play, these great tournaments to close out and just make a difference. So to get Olympics, then National USA Rugby Club National Championships, then, this, uh, then Rugby Town 7s, the MLR Draft, Yo, big, big, big weekend for rugby in the USA. And then, of course, uh, you know, I I actually feel bad for the overseas. New Zealand had to cancel a bunch of games. They went back into quarantine. So that's definitely never a positive, you know. Hopefully that they're they're good and, you know, and and it was just from a, like, I think like two COVID cases. Uh, But, you know, they don't play. They're not playing over there. And I I think it's still going to be very telling what's going to happen next year when it comes to the Women's Rugby World Cup. It's still a thing. Guys, we, we didn't have it this year, so uh, that's it's still supposed to be in New Zealand. So, um, yeah, it, it's great. But uh, I just wanted to quickly say big shout out to uh, our one of our former guests and uh, one of my homegirls, Coma Gandy Fishman, the head coach for the All Navy uh, rugby team. They won the Armed Forces, uh, the Armed Forces battle um, against you know USA Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Army. And uh, shout out to her because USA Na- U.S. Navy was able to get the championship in that in that matchup. So big, big to them. And then of course a great shout out not only just to all the teams that ended up performing and doing really you know performing and putting out their best for Rugby Town Sevens. If you guys don't know, there was a ten thousand dollar prize that goes at the end of that. So you know there's a really huge incentive. But to the winners of it, Samurai RFC. Uh, that's basically an all-star team, uh, like literally a full-ass all-star team uh, that happened. They won overall, beating SoCal Griffins 22-14. to And, of course, third-place team, Rambling Jesters, uh, for, for doing what they do. Like, those are those are hardcore teams. Those are almost close to pro. Almost. Like, almost close to semi-pro. Almost close to semi-pro. And I'm a big believer in the professional traveling rugby team. So, I had a lot of people that were, that have been on the cast, like, uh, uh, we had, like, Akinola Raymond uh, with uh, the Denver Barbarian, uh, Denver, the Tsunami Barbarians, who ended up winning their plate final. Uh, so, <clears throat> big shout out to them. Uh, Roots Rugby was in it. They didn't do as well, but they this was their first time getting out there. Had a great time. And you can see, like, they had uh, uh, Serevi as their coach, which is awesome. Shout out to Tiffany Faye, who's got to coach alongside. I know uh, she was looking to be able to get mentorship under him. So, I can't imagine how much she was able to take from that. And if you guys don't know who they are, go check back on the episodes. They're right there. Oh, yeah. And I didn't know. I don't know if I actually even said this uh, a few weeks, a, a couple weeks ago in the last episode. Uh, but big shout out to our friend Katie Sadlier. I think I didn't mention this, but I'm gonna mention it again. For uh, and you can check out her episode as well over uh, on here in the podcast. I believe 
It is episode. Ooh, I gotta go take a look. Where are you, Katie? Where is your Katie? Episode forty. Uh, and uh, you guys, she moved from being the the women's general manager at World Rugby, and starting in October, she will become the chief executive officer of the Commonwealth Games. So we got we got some great people. We mentioned already three: Comagandy Fishman, episode forty. 34, something like that. I, 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 didn't, I didn't write it out well. That's on me. But you can check her out there. Uh, we talked about Katie Akinola Raymond. Um, and, yeah, just obviously so much more. And, of course, guys, please, 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 please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to this. If you're seeing it on YouTube, please do the following. If you're hearing it on your podcast, please follow us on your respective platform, whether you are on Spotify, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, whether you're using iHeartMedia, please follow through. And if you guys are on Apple, please, I, we, need, we need reviews. We need some comments. I need, I, need, I need to know what's going on. I need to know what's going on. And it also allows us to be able to get pushed up by the algorithm. If you guys feel like this has value, like you guys get to learn more about people, please just take all you need, just three seconds, hit that five stars, four star, three star. If you got to go two and one, I mean, I, I get it. I prefer you didn't. I prefer you didn't. And so if I'm assuming that if people don't do it, then they're assuming there's a lot of two stars going on here. Mm, no. But no, we if you can, please, it helps the algorithm. It helps us being get pushed up the list. And of course, we want to be heard by more and more people. A lot of people uh, who who don't naturally get voice get voice and we get a lot of great information here. And you know, we're trying to be a little unconventional. Uh, it's it's, a, it's about being a little unconventional. Sometimes it gets a little repetitive out there, so we want to change it up a little bit. So, guys, I, I I really hope that you guys enjoyed this one because we got a great guest today. We got a great guest. This guy, I met this guy back in 2014 uh, whenever USA Rugby South took on Guyana for the NACRA at the time. NACRA, now it's known as RAN, but NACRA... Um, uh, uh, the NACRA uh, championship game and that was taking place at Life University in Marietta, Georgia. Guyana ended up getting the win on that on the last second kick. And we talk about this. I'm talking to the great, the powerful Theo Henry of Guyana Rugby. Uh, this dude was dope. We talked about actually uh, some a little bit some time ago, you know, but it was it was great getting to talk to him, getting to reminisce, getting to see where Guyana is getting ready to go because you guys need to look out for them. It's a team that has always been on the radar, but in the last few years had been thrown off. But Theo has a plan and a strategy and look for the Caribbean to be taken by storm by Guyana in this next over this next couple years because uh, they, they 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 have a history of being dangerous out there. They got a history of being dangerous. Um, but you guys, I, I, I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Also, please, before you guys get started, check out the check out the links below. We got some great offerings for you uh, over at Rugby Outlet Mall. We're actually coming to the end of our stock, and we're about to replace the entire store with new merch and gear as we get ready to transition into this new year. So, guys, if you don't have, if you haven't gone in there yet, definitely check it out. Definitely use the promo code, and I'm not even going to say it. I'm going to let you guys look into the links down below, and you're going to be able to see it. And, of course, if you guys are creating new websites, creating new websites, you guys want to be able to create e-commerce store, anything like that, give yourself an opportunity to make something as a club, go ahead and go check out Green Geeks. We use this for our website. By we, I mean me. Use it for my websites. Use it for my stores. Use it for my social media. Like, it is an amazing server. It allows you to utilize WordPress as a, a free, an offering and it makes everything so much cheaper they're so efficient great customer service and you guys can go hit that link below to be able to get uh, uh get a percentage off of w- any new service that you guys are getting off of that it'll be absolutely worth it and i'm telling you it's it's the best but in the meantime in the meantime you guys stay tuned we got a great one the great the awesome the amazing the wealth well Conversing, Theo Henry, head coach, guy on a rugby. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Time at Bailu, and 
we have an incredible VIP guest, very important V, very, very important I, and the people of the people holding it down for the great country of Guyana, Theo Henry, coach. Theo, man, how have you been taking care of yourself, man? I've, I've been good, <laughs> trying to keep my head above water. Oh, this is how we all doing, man. How how the pandemic treat you guys down there, by the way? Ah, uh, well, you know, I guess the same as everyone else. You know, but we're just trying to uh, do the best we could, you know, given the situation. Yo, no, I can feel that. Yo, I, and I'm I'm happy, happy. Like I said, it looks like you're doing well, and uh, I'm I'm glad you guys are up, and hopefully things continue to improve from there. Yeah. Well, you know, when I always start this, and I was telling you this right beforehand, I always like talking about uh, how I got to meet somebody, how I got to know about uh, the person I'm talking to first. And, um, uh, you know, I, I always remember, again, you guys were actually the uh, the first game that I ever tried to broadcast live and failed horribly at it, but was still able to get a game on. <laughs> you know, when uh, USA South for the NACRA championships came to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, USA South versus Guyana, uh, Guyana winning in the um, coming as the underdog, winning in the last second off of a kick. Yep. <laughs> oh, man, that bring back fun memories. Bro. Yo, yeah, that, was, that was awesome, bro. I was like, oh, man, it, it was it was one of the reasons why I remember saying, yo, I never want to watch a game get lost in memory because you had moments like that, that if nobody had been recording it, all it is is just talk, no proof. For, for real, for real. Um, I mean, every time, every time um, I look at the, the highlights of that game, you know, it, it just take me back to that moment. You know, it was it, that was incredible. I mean, 2014 was an incredible year for us yeah. in general because uh, we won the we won the um, the seven aside tournament in Mexico in similar fashion, came from behind, and and then. The same year we won the um the the, the fifteen in, in the similar fashion as well. Yeah, it was an amazing year, man. And and you know it was the first time. I'll, I'll be honest. It was the first time that I think I had both been able to know Guyana as a country because I'd only yeah. heard of it, but I don't think I've ever had ever experienced. I've experienced Bar- Barbadians and Bermudans, Jamaicans, obviously galore, but I'd never seen yeah. Guyana in itself. So it was such a, a impressive moment. And then to be like, oh, man, Guyana's like a real, like, rugby powerhouse coming through here and developing. Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was impressive. But, you know, uh, um, unfortunately, you know, times, times get hit. But, you know, you guys had this moment, and it looks like you're trying to bring this moment back again. And you've been slowly working your way back in. So I'm really happy and excited to hear basically what's been going on uh, to start with. But, um uh, well, basically, uh, in terms of games, in terms of um, training, uh, things things haven't been uh, going on since uh, the pandemic started. Uh, we, we were shut down since um, April April of twenty twenty, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's only recently, I would say, um, February February of this year, we started back uh, as a club training. Nice. Um, but we haven't played any games as yet because we haven't got any permission from the um, the the task force to go ahead with the games. Now I can understand, and like I said, like everything is coming back slowly, but it's coming back. So at least yeah. there's a little bit of a start. People are able to run around on the field a bit, and uh, sure. uh, look, it's only a matter of time before everybody's full fledged force. Hopefully by the fall. We're in in full full efficiency in terms of rugby. A lot of the guys are itching and itching to go. You know, they're eager <laughs> to get back on the pitch. Yeah, that's for sure. That's definitely a good look. That's the best problem to yeah. have. Like, hey, man, we don't have enough games, but we have too much passion. To we need a lot of passion to get out there. Oh, we're good. All right, just let us go loose. True. <laughs> I mean, we, we we're basically ch- trying to to hold them back because. I mean, the pandemic is still a serious uh, situation. Of course. You know, so, uh, taking health into consideration, you know, we're kind of skeptical of really allowing them to, to go full force, you know. Yeah. But we're still trying to, to um, make it happen for them 
you know, in the best we could. Hey, look, you know, again, it, it's in the bits and pieces, right? True, true. Right. So before we continue on a little bit more with Guyana and, and, and talking to that, I wanted to kind of get your story because I always say with every, uh, with every superhero story, there is an origin. And uh, you're the superhero here today. So I want to kind of start off with a question I always love to ask. Theo, how did you get started yeah. in rugby? Oh, man. This, I never get tired telling this story. This is an, it's an amazing story. I love it. Um, so... I'm a big fitness enthusiast. I love working, right? So uh, in my neighborhood where I'm from, uh, we used to, I used to work out at the gym. It was kind of a, a, a gym at the bottom of a house, you know, because we're in Guyana, there, there, there are houses where there's a there's a, 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 a top story. There's a house. There's a building at the top, and then there's a, a, a empty space on the bottom. So there was we had a lot of... Uh, free weight equipment uh, down at the bottom of the, under the house. So I used to work out uh, downstairs, right? And um, the guy that I used to work out at, he, he uh, relocated. So he took his way to him. So that left us without anywhere to work out, right? And um, one, of, one of my guys that I used to work out with, he started playing rugby. And um, he told me uh, if I started playing rugby with him, I get to use the, the, the uh, facility, the gym, the gym for free. Nice bait. He's like, look, look, we're not oh, going to let this body just go, just lift it. You, you got to do something with it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I went out I went out one day to training. So my intention was just to go training a couple of days, <laughs> use the gym, and that was it. I wasn't going to play the game. I didn't want to play the game. I wasn't interested. <laughs> right? So I trained I trained twice. I trained uh, a, a Tuesday evening and a, a Thursday evening. The coach uh, they, they had enough players to play on the weekend. So he threw me in the game. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I had my first field after two training sessions. After two? Right? No. After two training sessions, yeah. Man, I told you, I fall, I'm telling you, I fell I in love with that game just after that, that very first day. That was it. I was Man. No, you know what the thing is, though? And that, that's always the funny part when it comes to rugby. Like, I swear, it, as soon as you touch the field, as soon as you get on the field for a game, it just changes the whole mentality of your mind. You're just like, yo, everything feels right. Like, there's that buzz inside you where you're just like, okay, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be all right, but I don't know what's going to happen. And then once you get either yeah. like that first hit or you get that first True. touch of the ball, it's done. Oh, yeah, I was I was sharing I was sharing hits because I mean I, I hadn't any uh, experience or knowledge about attacking because I mean it was just my second game but I was physical I was I was making a lot of tackles so I fell in love with the physicality immediately. Man, yeah. So like even beforehand, other than lifting, did did you do any other kind of sports? Was it just soccer? Oh, I, or? Basketball was my was my first love. I played basketball in high school. And uh, in my neighborhood where I grew up, it's predominantly soccer. So soccer and basketball, those were my two games. Man, so, you know, you, you so basically, so you, you go into this contact sport and then all of a sudden it like, it like clicks in. I, I feel like there's that always that revelation moment where you're just like, why, 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 why has it been so long since I started this? <laughs> I'm telling you, I, you know, but I guess it, it happened at the right time, you know? mm -hmm. I wish I wish I started before, but um, I mean, it, it was a good look the time that I started. It was okay. Okay, so it was still fairly new. Yeah. Oh man, that's what's up. Okay, so you're coming in literally the ground floor to get the ground floor weights. <laughs> yeah. True. <laughs> oh no, I love that. So you know, after that first game, all right. Obviously, you kept coming back, but for you, yeah. like. Was there a mo when was that moment where you actually felt like you started understanding the game? Like you know, we have the we go off of our instincts, especially when it comes to hitting. We go off our instincts yeah. first. We're just like, okay, shoulder wrap, we'll figure it out. You know, even with the ball, it can be a little iffy. But then there's that moment where it starts to kind of come together a little bit, where you're just like, okay, I'm seeing what I'm supposed to. For you, what was that moment? 
I, that 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 moment was um that was like five months into to me started uh started rugby. Um, I was um well actually three months after I started playing, I was I was selected on a long list for um a national training a uh national program. And um, I think during that period of training in 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 the national setup, that's when I really came into my own and got a, a really good feel for the game. Because uh, eventually I, I ended up making that team. I made that team uh, after six months of playing uh, rugby. Yeah. Man, no, okay, that's dope. You know, that even in that moment, so you, you're talking about obviously such a short period of time from going from yeah. zero to 60, let's call it, right? True, yeah. For you, you know, was this one of the first moments that you had a chance to to rep for your country? Because it's it a was, different feeling, right, you know? It was It was an amazing feeling. You know, it was a really, it was a really amazing feeling. That's, that's when I really took the game serious. When I got my first nod. Uh, you know, when I was selected the very first time, I was, I was, I was hooked. That was it. Man, you know that first game. You know what? What? What was your feelings going into that one? The, the first guy that was against, you said against Trinidad, right? No, no, no. That that was a um a seven aside uh, championship in Jamaica. Okay, bro. Uh, that was that was um two thousand and one. That was a horrible year for me. I I experienced my my two. Only uh, injuries in that year uh, in in Jamaica uh, at the Seven Side Championship. At, at my very first game, like two minutes into the game, I was so eager to go. I sprained my ankle like two minutes into the game, and that was that was pretty much it for me for the for the rest of the, the um the tournament. Um, and then uh, I was selected for the Fifteen Side Tournament in Cayman Islands. November the same year. That that year, uh, about thirty minutes into the tournament, I broke my wrist. My God. <laughs> yeah, but but on the flip side, on the flip side, even even though I only played thirty minutes, the West Indies selectors saw enough of me that um they decided to select me for for the West Indies seven side team to play um the the seven side tournament in Chile and and. and Argentina, dude, that's so awesome. So you know, it 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 it, it, it at least shows you go hard on the field at any yeah. cost. <laughs> yeah, true, true. No, so so this one thing that I, I've I've always loved that, especially when it comes to rugby, and I I know there's a lot of travel sports, but I feel like rugby adds this different element, especially for whenever it's it's well for for those who haven't for you prior to going to travel with the rugby team, how often had you been off of the island itself? I've never traveled before rugby. Yo, so it opened <laughs> up the opportunity in the world right there. I, I swear, you know, I, if there's one thing I could say is that rugby gave me that opportunity and I will ever be indebted to rugby for making me uh, be able to see a lot of places. It was an amazing. Man, you know, I've always been a big believer that whenever a person is able to step outside of their their regular home range, especially whenever you get to see the world, a lot of problems that you have at home, not necessarily physically, but mentally become a lot smaller because you're you're able to see broadly. It gives you much more big, greater aspect. For you, you know, especially after that first game in Jamaica, even though all the injuries and everything, but being able to get off the island and then subsequently doing it again for the Cayman Islands and then, you know, follow up with Chile and Argentina. With with that feeling of being able to expand, what was it like bringing it back home for you? Like whenever you're talking to friends and family. Um, You know, just just to, to add a little bit to what you were saying in terms of being traveled, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer, but I like to tell persons, I wish everybody in Vienna would get the opportunity to travel, you know, because I think it would broaden their, um, their view, their view on, on, on life, because persons tend to think that um, the way that we do things is the only way it should be done, you know, 
But I think if you're exposed to different cultures and, uh, you know, get the opportunity to go to, to, to different places and see the way how uh, they do things, you know, I, I think a person would be a bit more, what is it, um, you know, come out of the bubble that we're in. Because I think, I think a lot of people live in a bubble, you know, thinking that our way is the only way. You know, but um, getting back to what you're saying about about uh, the travel, you know, it, it it really opened a lot of doors for me personally. You know, um, it it gave me the opportunity to know that there there's things beyond the the, the things that I even imagined that I could, I could have done that I could get into. You know, because I was exposed to a lot. So, you know, I wish everybody would get that opportunity as well. No, it, it's almost like it, it, it's, it's an unlock. It unlocks another part of that soul, another part of that mind to, to yeah. expand upon it. No, I, I love to hear that. I love hearing that. Like, you know, especially for a place. So I know on the island, I'm not saying all of it's a monolith, but I know on the island, you know, Cayman well, came Islands and Jamaica might have a lot more familiarity with Guyana. But whenever you went to a place like Chile, and Argentina, uh, for yeah. you, like what, what was that experience like? Because we're talking about a different culture. I mean, almost night and day, literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, to, to be honest, Argentina, it, it was kind of a culture shock because mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, you had to readjust. First of all, you got you had to get readjusted to the weather mm -hmm. because. You know, weird sunshine and rain. You know, Argentina, even though it might not be snowing at the at that period, it, it gets really cold. Mm. So um that was the first thing. Um the food was different, you know. Not not being able to speak Spanish was a challenge. You know, but um I'm I'm the type of person I think I, I I end up to any kind of situation. So uh, it wasn't really much of a challenge for me personally. You know, it, it just took me a couple of days to really get myself through the goals. Yeah, but it was okay. It was a really good experience. No, no, that's what's up. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, uh, yeah, like, I, I know I felt the same. Like, I, I, I went down to, to Brazil recently, and, you know, even at that, like, you get the language, you get the, 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 the environment, and you just, it, it, it again, it's, there's so much that feels similar, and then there's that big hit that you go that's like, oh, okay, this is, I am in another place. Like I, I'm, this yeah. I'm not at home. <laughs> but I, the the thing that that I think makes it easy, you know, is is the the brotherhood of rugby because of the fact that you you you're among your rugby brothers, right? You know, you know, rugby is a universal language. You know, it doesn't matter where you at. You know, once you speak rugby. That's it. You're, you're you're a part of the crew. This is fine. No, I, I figured if I figured if it was a case whereby I was just traveling by myself, you know, it might have been diff a, a totally different experience. Right. No, that's yeah. true. It's true. It it's it's it, it, it's a protective bubble, but it's the best bubble. Like it's that fraternity. Uh, we always say it is is the I consider it the largest fraternity that doesn't require hazing. <laughs> of all yeah. True. True. Man, no, I love that. I love that. So, you know, you, you, you're developing in through this, this rugby sphere. And, and it, within, a, within a year, it sounds like within about, yeah, within a year, you had already reached a national team. You've already done both sevens and 15s, which most people usually choose one or the other. And then you yeah. had an all-star team. So as you've gotten deeper into this, how has been the development of Guy Guyanese rugby in that time? Because as you said, when you started, it was it was bit fairly new. So what, yeah. what, what was the development like within the country? Because again, you said basketball and football seem to be the clear the clear sports of the area. No, no, no. Basketball, basketball was my choice. Okay. Cricket, cricket and football oh. are the two main choices in the area. Touche. Um, the development of rugby was it was steady. When when I started playing, rugby was already developed in Indiana, right? Um, rugby was being played here uh, 
as early as back in the 60s. Okay. All right. But um, in terms of, of the, the, the best period in terms of one of the most successful era, uh, that occurred during my stint in terms of playing. All right. Um, so I would say it, it, took, it, it took me personally, it took me uh, five years to, to, to develop a, a, willing, a winning culture with the team. Right. Because uh, from 2006 to, like, from 2006 to present, even though we haven't, we haven't played, all right, let's say from 2006 to 2019, right? Um, Guyana's won to date eight seven side championship right. from 2006 to 2019. Six of them, six of those championships were consecutive championships. You know, so we've we've been doing fairly well in terms of winning. What what do you think has been accustomed to that? Because again, even even though the history has been long, I, even in the states, the history has been long. But it still feels yeah. like it's still a really sh- new sport. So, uh, uh, what what do you think has been uh, so key to your guys' ability to have that winning culture? What happened in that? You said it took about five years. So, what happened between '06 and 2011 that? So, so what happened was um, every from 2005 from 2005 to. Uh, from 2005 to about 2008, the the the, the West Indies rugby team was fully functional, right? So, um, when we played in the regional tournaments, uh, they would usually select an All Star team that would um go to the US and play against uh the likes of. Fiji, New Zealand, Australia—you know the big seven-side teams uh, in the in the um, Los Angeles Sevens at that time, as well as the San, the San Diego Sevens. Um, so we were fortunate enough that we had uh, about three to four guys consistently being selected to represent the West Indies team. So I I, I think that um. The, the 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 opportunity for us to play at that level and being able to come back and share the experience with the local guys, you know, I think that kind of created that that, that winning culture for us. You know, and, and that makes sense. You know, you, you you get to tap into one different coaching, two, like you said, the different talent levels. So you're getting to. Yeah kind of iron sharpening iron simultaneously and then retain that and being able to teach us. And I'm assuming that was happening. Like how long did the, all uh, the West Indies team last? Like, do you know how long it had been going on uh, up to that point? Um, Well, it's 2001 was, was my first not at the team. It, It has been on and off between 2000, from about 2000 to 2008, it, it was on and off. Okay, okay. So yeah. you had a pretty solid amount of years. So by the time it gets to 06 to 08, you know, you have a solid seven, six, seven, five to seven years of guys having come through that program over and over. And I'm assuming a good, yeah. like half of them became coaches or coached in some way, shape, or form. So you have that player coach mentality bringing up new generations, right? Yep, exactly. So what was, you know, even in spite of that, like what was the, the youth, like the generational um, reload, I like to say? Like how was the youth programs and uh, as opposed to maybe a club um, and uh, maybe U23s? Like how did you guys manage to keep uh, a constant roster, I guess to say the least? So the youth program was, was pretty solid uh, back uh, Around that period, um, because um, we we started the, the school, the youth development program in schools, which 
allowed us to 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 create a a really good and the and the eighteen team that won three consecutive championships as well. Nice. And most of the players from that on the eighteen team made up the nucleus made up the nucleus of the seven side team that was so dominant. That makes sense. So it, it was everything's just been was churning well. You guys really had a system already in place between guys being able to go out and bring knowledge in while also being able to uh, develop Correct. players uh, yep. uh, underneath. So, Correct. so you guys are going through this for you. You know, you're seeing this two way street. Who are some of the people that mentored you in your process that helped your, the, the ease of your development in rugby? Um, locally. I mean, both locally and, and, and nationally. I just, where, where was most of your inspiration from, directly and indirectly? Well, most of my inspiration came from, from watching uh, Fiji play. Mm. Yeah, Good mentor. I was a big Surevi fan. Uh, Surevi. I, literally, I was watching Surevi on VHS. I literally used to pause that VHS, rewind, play it, rewind it again, go out into the yard, practice that move, get back inside, watch that tape again. One game, one seven-side game, literally would, would, would take me maybe like an hour, an hour and a half to watch. 15 minutes. A 15 minute, 15 minutes game would take me like an hour and a half to watch. Just rewinding it back for just just make sure. Look, let me get the footwork. How's his footwork going? Get exactly. that jump step. <laughs> Precisely, yep. Yeah. Uh, and locally, locally, uh, I had the opportunity to play with a guy named uh, Conrad Arjun. That was that was my um, my national captain at that period. He was he was really influential in terms of you know empowering me. Because it, he he played um, a standoff. He played uh, uh, ten, and I played twelve. But he allowed me to to make a lot of the, the decision in terms of you know the stuff that we would execute. And you know, I think it, it kind of built my confidence as a player. No, that's what's up, and that's what that's what you always want from from again your captain. Really is. Look, yeah. I want you to I want to show that you can trust me while also helping me to be able to hone the craft bit by bit. So if he's setting you up on the passes, especially as an inside center, like you're yeah. you're basically having that one on one connection and knowing that you guys can be that that thunder and lightning duo or just have that that dynamic, man, it allows you to be able to take the responsibility of seeing the field so much. It did. It really did. Man, I love that. You know, you 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 you've been able to see a, so much success over the time with with Guyana leading up, and I'm I'm leading up to that that NACRA championship. Even though you guys had a bunch, but you know, going in that as you're getting more and more, what was it that was going into that 2013 2014 year um, that you guys just it it seemed to all click together? Like you said, 2014, you. Sevens and fifteens was yours. What what was it like that last that those two years, 2012, 2013, that gave you guys so much impact? Well, um 2014 was basically it was a redemption tournament for us because um we we uh we lost our championship. So we were we were the defending champions. Of 2011, so we we won it in 2011. Then we went to to the the, the, the tournament in Canada, and we lost in Canada. So, you know, a lot of the guys were were pretty upset that we, you know, the streak we lost the streak because that was it. The the sixth championship straight, you know, we were going for the seventh one, but we didn't get it. So a lot of guys were quite upset. Then um, the following year, which was 2013, 
uh, the tournament was held in, in Cayman Islands. And we were unable to attend the tournament because um, at that period they were having, um, it was hurricane season as well. So we weren't, we weren't able to, to get a flight into Cayman Islands. So Trinidad ended up winning that tournament in Cayman Islands, you know. So we felt a bit slighted that we weren't able to attend the tournament, you know. So <laughs> you weren't you weren't allowed to get were, the belt. It was like, oh, no, it, it's so, not even a real tournament. We weren't even allowed to be there, but not even our own control. <laughs> exactly. So you know, we felt like, yo, um, you know, you guys are the champion, but uh, we weren't there. You know, we felt we we really felt that we were the real champions. <laughs> you know, so. Um, the guys were eager to get into Mexico to, to kind of redeem ourselves. You know, so that's what really sparked the entire um, the, the, the 2014 run. But um, the, the, and that was pertaining to the 7 side championship. But for the, mm. 15, for the 15 side tournament, it was basically the fact that the, the, championship, the, the championship was eluding us for quite a long time. Now, I mean, we we were getting to the to, to the finals a lot. I think we went to the, we went to the finals maybe like two or three consecutive years, but we just weren't able to get over the hump. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the guys were like, you know, we definitely felt 2014 had to be the year. No, so it was just like, okay, all right, we're 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 going over the hump this year. Like, there's nothing yeah. left. We're, we're going over this hump one way or another. And look, and it was exactly. a close game. Like, especially I remember for that one, I remember because it it's on my channel, I remember it was just because it was like uh, USA South went up early, and then something, you guys had whatever conversation in the second half, and just like, it really ended the first half, and just started like coming back with it. Uh, let, me, let me be honest with you. I basically told the guys, listen, we are going to win this game. You know, I just felt it in my heart that we were going to win this game. And um, what happened was, even though the U.S. was up, I think it was, um, I think it was 28 to 3. Right? Something like that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was even that high. I, it was still a pretty close game. I think it was like 14-3 or something like that. Or, yeah, bro. No, at the half, they were up. They were in the 20s at the half. Right, right. You know what? You're right. You're right. Yeah, so we scored. We scored a try uh, in the nine minutes of the first half, right? And I, so that kind of gave me even more. It, it, it kind of made my statement a bit more valid. I was like, guys, we are gonna win this game. These guys are tired, right? So I think the guys bought into what I was saying, you know, because they came down with fire in the eyes in the, in the second half, you know. And we really went to work, man. And and to work, you guys did because I remember it was just like long run, long run, and then crash, crash, yeah. and then it was just oh man. Because I know you got you got a score out of that game as well too. And I, I'm telling you, I think that score, that score, is what really, really made the guys actually believe. Because I wasn't just talking it; I did it. You know, I was like, yo, we're gonna win this game, and that that was an amazing try. Man, yo, I love that. Yo, and yeah. you guys came out that game. You guys won it last second off the uh the ex not the extra point, off of the uh um the the free kick, the oh my god, the three pointer. Yeah, the yeah. penalty kick. Thank you. Sorry. You yeah. know you get those mind blubs. Um <laughs> and off the penalty kick at the last second from the corner at that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was it was a really like, good it, you know, I just remember it was just like wow. What a game. It was like, this is a great game. And I was so sad I couldn't broadcast it, but I was so happy editing it. I, I, up, to, up to this day, I, I think that game was probably the game of, this, of, the, of, of 2014. Yeah. And, and, and I'm talking about even international, even international teams. I think that was a really good game. Yeah, no, because you know what? Honestly, I wouldn't. I'm not surprised because it was there. It was it. It was basically a movie story in real time. Yeah, it, it really was a movie story in real time. Um, and I knew a lot of the guys that played for the USA South, so it was kind of interesting the dynamics of it. 
But uh, like I said, it was one that I was so happy that I had the opportunity to be able to grab at that time. You know, so like after you guys come off of that game, the 2014 season, uh, I don't remember 2015, you guys were in it and in 2016, you guys went out. But what, something happened and there seemed to be in a tail off from there. What, what happened after that season? So 20, 2015, we went to North Carolina. Right. Uh, For Kerry, you got the sevens, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, we lost. Uh, in North Carolina again. And, um, for what it's worth, that was a really tough situation. Like, it, it was not built for anybody except for the U.S. to come out of that. Like, I don't feel like it was... It was. <laughs> there was nothing. Like, I, I was there, too. I, I, there was no way. And USA was going to go to the Olympics. Like, it, they were going to go. <laughs> Fox. Fox. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, 2015 was another down year for us. You know, we picked it back up in 2016. So, yeah, that was, that's how it was. Yeah. So, so from, from that point until 2019, because 2020 was 40 years of nothing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, what, what had you guys been doing? Because it seems like, what, what had your career been going on within rugby? Because, uh, you know, from there to now being coach and strength and conditioning coach and now being able to be part of this revival, like what, what happened in the, the four years after 2016 to 2020, give or take? So um, 2016, uh, I was, I, I went to, to, to Hungary on a scholarship to do um, a strength and conditioning diploma at the, at the uh, School of Physical Education in Hungary. So that was pretty much my highlight for 20, uh, 2016. Uh, when I came back home, I worked a bit with the female uh, national side. Yeah. And then I worked with, with them the following year as well. And that was pretty much it for me in terms of coaching until uh, 2019, I was reappointed the uh, national coach for the senior men's side again, seven side. Nice. So, so with the team itself, though, as well, so you're off. You can't play. You're, you're overseas working on strength and conditioning and developing your, your skills on that. So yeah. when you – with the team itself, like, what was going on with the program? Because, it, again, in, without offense, but it doesn't feel like Guyana is the same program that it was, you know, five years ago. Um, what, what, what occurred? Was issues with youth rugby or – Travel or um, it was a bit of of issue with the development of youth, as well as the turnover of of, of youth into the to the side. Right? You know, it's something that I've I've been stressing for the better part of maybe five to six years. Right. You know, I was trying to get a lot of um. Well, to create a blend of, of senior players as well as youth, as well as youth into the national setup, because um, I think in terms of longevity, in terms of maintaining that winning culture, we needed to have younger legs in, in the program, which we failed to do. You know, so it kind of set us back where we have to do into entire rebuilding stage. No, and that makes sense. It, 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 it's, it's difficult to reload if there's nobody there to be able to reload in. Sure. You know, um, and, and it catches us all. And so I, it, it was something that I wanted because I even know, like when it came to the U- U19 tournaments, I know Guyana had been very evident there and then they weren't. So that made me yeah. always wonder if that was part of it. So now that you've gotten this appointment into the national coaches and obviously – uh, 2020 has been basically a lost year of 100 years. I, I like to constantly exaggerate the fact that this was a thousand years of nothing. We have all aged. But, you know, for you now that you are in that position, that not that you weren't already a leader, but now that you have even more influence on the day to days. You know, what is it that you are hoping to be able to do moving forward to be able to 
bring back the the winning culture that Guyana has historically been known for? Well, I think the operative word you use there is culture. I'm trying to reinstill the culture into the, into the new crop of players coming through. Because um, I think for some reason or the other, I think we strayed away from our own culture um, a, a couple of years prior to us, um, you know, not performing as we used to. You know, so um, that is one of the things I'm trying to, to, to get back into the program, the culture of working hard. I'm a firm believer of persons working hard and earning their spot. Right. No, yeah. no, no favoritism. Let the nepotism, let the, let the meritocracy play out in the way that it needs to. Exactly. You know, like, you know, for you in, in, in doing that, is there anybody that just like you had whenever you were uh, playing, is there people that you are emulating now as a coach? Because I've, I've talked to players who move from the national side over to the coaching side, and, and they've always mentioned the challenges that they've had. For you, is there anybody that you use as a lead to be able to um, to be able to coach, either out in rugby or outside of it? So, um, I've been coaching the national side for quite a long time now. This is not my first. This is my um, second appointment as national coach because um, since two thousand ten, I had the opportunity of working with um, Joe Whipple. Who used to be the, the the head coach of the West Indies team? I was his his assistant, even as a player. Then I took over the national t- team as a, a player coach in 2011, and I coached the team all the way up to 2015. Right in in from 2011 to 2015, we won a total of. Um, two championships with nice. me as as player coach, right? Then, um, so you, you, the question you asked is about the, the coaches that are influential in terms of me making that, that transition. I would say um, Gordon T. Jens from, from New Zealand that, that, that used to coach uh, the All Blacks. I had the opportunity of being his understudy one time when I was um, at a at, uh, training camp in, in, in Las Vegas. Nice. Yes. Um, Al Cavalli, I used to coach the, the U.S. Eagle. Mm-hmm. I had the opportunity of working with him as well at a training camp in, in, in Argentina. You know, so I, um, those guys are the guys that, you know. Some high regard. Kind of me, yeah, uh, that uh, I look up to. And, and and look forward to to emulating. <laughs> Yo, I love that. I love that. You know, kind kind of winding down. You know, as you continue to see what 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 the future holds, I've I've been a big believer that the pandemic, as as annoying as it has been and inconveniencing and and tragic as it's been for so many, I think it opened up a lot of of. Um, opportunity for new ideas and new ways of, of people going about it. I, I consider this to be the, the revolution of rugby where you, people have the opportunity now to uh, actually be not just rugby within the, the, the culture of it as we know it, but to actually include the stylization of different cultures. Like there can be, instead of it being the European version of, I always talk about with the U.S., the England version of U.S. rugby or the U.S. rugby of England rugby, the U.S. version yeah. of England rugby or the, the whatever country version of all, the All Blacks rugby, it becomes yours. For you, yeah. what do you foresee as Guyanese rugby? What, what would you describe the style of Guyanese rugby at its best? Um. The style of, of, of Guyanese rugby, I would say, is pretty much a mixture of Fiji and Kenya. In terms of Fiji in terms of flair and Kenya in terms of speed 
and in terms of, of that grit, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, that that I would say that would be a perfect blend of, of our our game. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And, I, I, and, I, and I can I, I can legitimately see that where and it goes very naturally, you know, because cool. I think that's yeah. one part that we is always been trying to figure out. How do you make sure that the style fits well with your own personal culture so that people buy in the heaviest from that moment? And, and the, the style much must match the characteristics or, or the composition of the place that you have. Exactly. You know, you cannot have uh, big, stocky, slow players and trying to play fast here. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's counterproductive. So, basically, uh, our st- the, the style that we would develop would be suitable for the, for the, the composition of players that we have. No, I love that. I love that. And do you find yourselves now even being able to find uh, new ways even about going about recruiting? Because now, obviously, again, the pandemic is still in play, but now, you know, it, it's the opportunity to be more creative with it or, or finding it. Like, do you, is the plan that you guys have for recruiting new players something that you feel confident about or do you think it's something that's still a work in progress? I, I think it's still a work in progress. Um, what we have right now is basically a lot of players just gravitate, gravitating towards the game after they own a card. You know, I think we need to go on a bit more aggressive drive in terms of attracting players instead of just hoping players come, you know, naturally to us. No, that makes sense. And what, what, what how does um, the country of Guyana uh, kind of respond to rugby. I know it's it's, it's a still a small, medium sized country. Like, how does it respond in terms of 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 its existence? I repeat, repeat. I didn't hear you. No problem. I was saying, how does the country of Guyana respond to rugby? Because I know every country has a different response. I know talking with Trinidad, uh, they were like, "Well, we already know." Like, people understand rugby pretty well. Versus, uh, I think talking with a place like Syria where it's just out of sight, out of mind. This, this, this doesn't connect the same because we have, you know, all these other sports and everything else going around. How about the, for Guyana? How is it for you guys? So well, what I would say, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, cricket as well as soccer, those are the two main sports. It's creme but, de la um, creme. But one thing rugby will always have is that we were at our height, we were the most su- one of the most successful sporting team in the country. Nice. So, with that said, you know the, 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 there, there will always be a place in 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 the heart of Guyanese for us. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that. So, final words from you. Uh, what is uh, last last thing from you? What is something that you want people to know about Guyana rugby uh, that either it dispels any myths or it's something that you feel uh, needs to be uh, needs to be emphasized so that people know what's going on with Guyanese rugby. Um, I think the only thing that um, I basically would, would 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 say is that I think the 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 standard that we set you know, during the winning era, I think persons around the, especially around the region, you know, got a bit disappointed in terms of us turning up and not really bringing that same fight, that same energy to the tournaments because persons would usually say, um, you know, what's up with you guys? You guys are on the same team as before. And it, it, was, a, it was a fact. You know, so it is a work in progress, but rest assured, we'll be back. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Yo, yeah. Theo, uh, yo, let people know where they can find any information about Guyana rugby. Yeah, so uh, during the pandemic, uh, 
I, I had the opportunity of starting something that I really wanted to start it for quite a bit, but I've been dragging my foot on it for, for you the know, longest. You know, that's why I said the pandemic has added, like, it was. it's the one benefit. As much of the tragedy and all the lives lost and we hate all of that, but it, like, opened yeah. up another thing where it's like, you know what? Why not? Why exactly. not? Exactly. You know, and it, it goes hand in hand with, 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 um, with my belief in terms of uh, the culture of rugby. Well, the, the Guyanese culture of rugby, mm. because we, we've been noted, noted for our hard work, you know, for the, all the years we've been playing. And we've always been one of the fittest teams to show up at any tournament. Right. Right. So my love for fitness, well, it started before rugby, but um, during, my period, during my period of playing rugby and playing at maybe, let's say, at the highest level for quite a bit, you know, I fell in love even more with fitness, which prompted me to start my own fitness club. It's called Inner Strength Fitness. You know, um, congratulations. One of the things that, yeah, yeah, thank you, man. One of the things I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, not just work, working with rugby players, but working with uh, various uh, sporting entities, you know, getting their, 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 their players uh, fit and prepared for national engagements, even local engagements. You know, it's been a passion of mine for quite a bit, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm doing it right now. Dude, man, yo, one big congrats on that because that's that's always a big leap, especially when taking ownership of something that getting ownership of something that's yours. I'm a big advocate of that. And then second, yeah. especially in this era, as we've become not I'm not going to say as we become softer or anything like that. I'm talking about more on the need to be able to develop good habits with our health, uh, you yeah. know, so to be able to be able to be a part of that movement. Um, yo, dude, please let me know if there's anything that I can do to be able to help on that. It, whether it's whether you're just doing online anything or anything I can suggest, let me know because you know I'd love to be able to help in, in making helping you progress on that. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> so, Diana Rugby, we have a, um, a YouTube page, oh, no, no, sorry, a Facebook page, you know, uh, Diana Rugby Football Union. You know, so basically you could get on there and you could interact with us. Yo, I love it. I love it. Theo, man, I legitimately appreciate this. I, I'm very happy to be able to also get to talk to you, to you again and uh, have this opportunity, man. Yeah, it was a pleasure, bro. Theo, man, dude, I am so grateful for you to be on here. Man, it was dope talking with you, getting a chance to be able to uh, catch back up. Look forward to it again. And, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you guys took the dimes that were there and turned them into and recognized the gems that were dropped out of that. Um, guys, please go ahead. If you can, we got some amazing other ones. Last week we had um, we had Cody Melfi on the show. Uh, previously, we had Mick Feely of Citizens Rugby. We had Maria Thomas, uh, Phaedra Knight. We've had Robbie Owens, a.k.a. Squidge Rugby. Uh, Karima Prince of Prairie View A&M. Kirill Guthrie of the James G. Uh, and uh, James G. Robertson and Clive Sullivan Foundation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've had great ones. Uh, Vice President of Jamaica Rugby Union, Keyshan Downs. We've got uh, Ryan Ginty of Next Level Rugby, who did all the MLR games. Shout out to them and the draft. Uh, like I mentioned, Katie Sadlier, Ada Milby, uh, Tozan Tutitanwe, Warren Mullis, and Preston Thompson of uh, 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 American Rugby Pod. Guys, we got so much content. We got Olympic winners. We got we got anyone that you guys need, and we're bringing in even more. So. Guys, you guys enjoy, but most importantly, I hope you know, I hope you're happy, I hope you are healthy, and most of all, I hope you know that you are highly favored. Until next time, y'all. Cheers.